Thanks, Jameis. <clears throat> hey, Suzanne. Hey, Scott. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself to me? Yeah, yeah. The next thing is the class, Mangan Dodem, Winnipeg Donji. Um, my name is uh, Scott. I'm from Winnipeg, um, and I'm a visual artist. Hamataki Oki, I'm Petu Wash Day. Zen Kaida Machia Pichto, Oglala Himacha. I am Oglala Lakota. Tante Wash Tea, Na Pitch Yuzapo. My relatives, I shake your hand with a happy heart. Um, currently, Muscogee Creek Reservation or Tulsa, Oklahoma, LWT. Um, yeah, uh, just a bit of background about myself. I'm a performance artist uh, and a composer. I'm from Southern California. Currently, I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia University. And um, I have been, I was a contributor and a global coordinator and a little bit of an editor for this indigenous position paper. And my contribution was called How to Build Anything Ethically. Yeah, I guess I should, uh, my contribution for the vignettes was Guillen's The Old Lady and the Octopus Bag Device. So, um, what uh, what year did uh, did we go to uh, Hawaii for this? 2006. Oh, the years have all blended. I know they've all blended together. But uh, um, did you want to did you want to start off with a little bit uh, about your your uh, the work that you did? Yeah, sure. I'm gonna do kind of a five minute quick presentation on um, my work. Hopefully, it makes sense going quickly. Uh, my website and everything. So mostly my practice is um, an artistic practice uh, that has to do with building body interfaces and performing with them. But uh, in the process of, of working through this and uh, starting to work on my PhD, I began to think a lot about, uh, I was a research assistant for the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, where that's where I met Scott, um, who's in residence there. And uh, I started to try to think about relationships to the non-human and how that could inform uh, my relationship to technology I was using in my performance practice. And, and as I started to use machine learning, I started to realize that uh, Lakota definitions about who gets to be a being and why are the root of, to me, the ontological differences between Lakota ethics, lots of maybe indigenous ethics and, and other forms of ethics. So uh, a lot of the work that I think about comes from uh, Vine Deloria Jr. Uh, and I love this quote um, by him, uh, which is respect involves two attitudes. One attitude is the acceptance of self-discipline by humans and their communities to act responsibly towards other forms of life. The other is to seek to establish communications and covenants with other forms of life on a mutual, mutually agreeable basis. And so, you know, in my, in the, the paper before this one, for Indigenous um, Protocols and Artificial Intelligence, uh, it was a co-writer with Jason Lewis, uh, Nolan Urista, and Archie Chowis, and um, on a paper called Making Kim with Machines. And I was trying to argue, uh, it's not a question of whether machines deserve to be entities, but a question, a much larger question of what on, which ontologies we will choose to shape our world. Who is allowed to be a being? And then um, when we use these ontologies, do they support an ethics which leads to um, abusing our human and non-human kin? Um, I, I'll skip this slide, but I will show a little bit, this is kind of a little breakdown of different definitions of um, interiority. And so I think a lot about uh, non-human interiority in my practice. Um, this is drawn from a, a the ethnographic work of um, David C. Posthumus. Uh, who, what is inside a, a being and is that limited to humans? And in Lakota philosophy, no, absolutely not. So this led to a lot of artwork. This is a collaboration with Devin Ronneberg, um, an interactive sculpture uh, taken from a dream that my grandfather had and uh, told me I should, I should make art about his dream. So I did. Um, and, uh, and now we've got an online version that's about to go up to the University of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> And all of my work, I, I slowly transition this place where I'm really in co constant conversation with my family members, especially my cousin, Corey Stover. Um, this is us um, at a gallery in Omaha. And really thinking about what our relationships are with stones. Um, the stones are very involved in 
our um, ceremonies and in our daily life, actually. Um, this is my grandfather, uh, and who I published a little bit with. Um, and yeah, I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, this is Making Kim with the Machines, which is available um, through MIT Press. Uh, and it's also published now. And um, yeah, let me, there was one more slide I wanted to show. Oh yeah, this is kind of my very like basic breakdown of what's in the how to build anything ethically. And uh, I was trying to propose a protocol stream where we've got different streams of uh, con like there's a there's a if AI is a thing we're trying to make ethically, I better here we go. Uh, then I imagine all of these streams of protocol leading into this thing. Uh, where um, we need to have good governance protocol, coding language, software design, use, distribution, compensation, the physical computing device, data collection, and all of those have to be done in a good way if we're going to have um, a final product that is a good final product. All of these steps need to be done. So that's how I've been thinking about this and kind of in response, I've been working on this, um, teaching a Native American music class at CalArts right now. And uh, I've been thinking about, you know, where do ethics come from? Um, what kind of ethics am I doing? And I'm starting to think about it through uh, Leanne Simpson's, as we've always done, thinking about listening to land, which from the land comes our, um, comes the identification of who's a being or the understanding of what kind of interiority I have versus um, other non, not me, other non-humans, humans and non-humans. And then that leads to um, ways of knowing epistemologies. And, and I think after that comes ethics. And I really think it's the hyperlocality of our ontologies um, that gives us ethics on the other end. So uh, that's kind of it. Uh, this is a quote from my grandfather um, who was telling me that the future is dangerous, um, but uh, our spirits and our ancestors uh, even those in non-human form are just there on the other side trying to help us. Um, and it's our responsibility to listen to them. So, yeah. It's a beautiful quote from your grandfather there. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll do the same thing a little bit. Um, I won't go so much into the practice that I'm doing, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the work I did um, for the position paper. Um, and to start off, I'll just uh, see, I'm just gonna do a quick screen share. And we'll start off with uh, this. This is uh, sort of the the, the basis that uh, the, the piece that I wrote. And the, and the piece that I wrote was a, a short story based on the old stories, the Adizukan uh, or sacred stories that sort of uh, tell us about our histories as Anishinaabe people. Um, and so I, I was thinking a lot about how uh, I was considering um, that the making of things, the making of AI, what that means for our community. And I, I was brought back to um, a story uh, that I read in my undergrad like 20 years ago. Uh, and it was the story about this really short, really tiny, locked away in this uh, this old book somewhere. I don't even remember. I can't, couldn't find the book. And uh, it was about how this little boy went and uh, had to challenge this uh, old lady for, for the rights to have this piece of technology. And he had to do that four times with the help of his full community. And I was thinking about this when I, when I entered into, uh, when I was invited to Honolulu, bringing the idea of that, um, what, is the nature, what is the nature of AI and what is it going to be for our, our communities? And, uh, and I thought, well, our communities have encountered new technologies. Uh, uh, like, like all cultures, we, evolve, we, we encounter new technologies Throughout, throughout these histories. And uh, this, this is nothing new. This is just another new sort of horizon for us to explore. And uh, so I looked back and I thought, well, what is the models that we use to help maintain balance in our communities? And that was sort of like one of the things that has always meant a lot to me is the Oshkabewis, which is uh, the Oshkabewis is a helper in our community. And so they're the ones that um, provide assistance to anyone that needs it in whatever way that they can. And so sort of a very honorable and very proud position to have because that is what keeps the community active and uh, uh, engaged and together without all those without being a scabewis we can't pass on knowledge and we cannot uh, cannot assist each other to continue on to the next to the next phase of our uh, community 
And so I thought, oh, well, taking the idea of the uh, the AI as as a Scabeus and a helper to us, that we're developing this helper versus something like a, like a um, like a, like a thing that's scary. So if we design it from the ground up as a, as a helper and an assistant to us and us to it, uh, it, be, it becomes a whole different thing. So this is the basis of uh, this writing piece that I did. And thinking of the physical structures of the making of the of AI, I sort of went back to one of our um, very uh, identifiable um, uh, <clears throat> pieces of art and there's a bandolier bag and uh, bandolier bags uh, sort of are, are very identifiably uh, Anishinaabe or Anishinaabe and I was looking at how they're constructed and the designs they used and uh, I don't know if this is going to work oh yeah so I was like and I used this as sort of the this jumping off point to how to construct an AI looking at these bags what they mean symbolically and uh, spiritually and how they're constructed and sort of the designs are sort of um, indicative of that complexity and that history and that spirituality and those ethics are built into the technology and then in the art and so the art sort of encodes our stories and those stories are, are maps to the future and so I considered these stories and this story that I wrote as a map for the future and a guidepost for myself engaging with these new technologies um, and uh, so the, the other little part of it, I would say that was really uh, what I had to do is because I'm not a computer scientist, and obviously uh, that I had to go back and sort of educate myself about sort of the origins of AI, how it all comes together. And I, I started looking at like uh, uh, really alternate computing forms. And one of those things was, you know, using DNA as a computing, computational device and a storage uh, storage device. And that was uh, sort of when I saw the shapes of uh, DNA and the sort of the shapes of back propagation for uh, AI algorithms, these all kind of came together and I thought, oh, we can think about these things as, as sort of intertwined and entangled parts of the same thing and sort of it gave me a sort of a territory to start from. Um, I'd like to just point out the, the, the amazing artwork from uh, Carrie Noy. Um, she, she converted those images into beautiful uh, uh, design work for the for the whole position paper and uh, she did a wonderful job so I just wanted to keep that in sort of um, show that a little bit um, and uh, I guess what the other the, the last thing I would like to say about or talk to, to to bring up is the when I was thinking about what to say about the work that we did for the for the protocol work the the nature of the workshops themselves were sort of this revelation, like uh, the making of things, right? The ethics, where the ethics lie, and you know, all of us. There was there was many of us from all sort of different uh, vocations. There was uh, computer engineers, scientists, cultural theorists, artists, uh, writers, uh, authors, whatever, and they all came together with all these different fluency and different dialects and different vocations. But we all came together and worked really well together because we had this common territory built on a on a sort of um, ethics of indigenous community and sort of keep keeping that in mind. So I think that was really something that stood out for me in terms of um, where those ethics lie, you know, and so that we can, we could have come together, we didn't know each other's communities, or languages or horse stories, we still had a very strong base from which to sort of really engage with these new territories that we're talking about with indigenous in, uh, protocol and AI. So. Um, yeah, I think that's what I want to say for this. Cool. I want to share. Can I share one more time? I'm going to share um, this. I wanted to show also um, this framework um, that I was thinking of. Uh, let's see. So this is the. I, fl I flew by this slide, but I wanted to point out that you know, similar to, similarly to the octopus bag. I was drawing upon, um, during the workshop we had, it was two days and the first day we spent um, brainstorming together, working together, but then the second day we got, we sat down and we went really in depth into brainstorming what we wanted to dive deeper into. And in the group I was in, we were talking very much about frameworks. And so similarly to the, um, looking at SCABE as a framework, um, I was looking at uh, with Scott and with other people that came to the table, um, uh, the sweat lodge, um, the process by which one makes a sweat lodge as a really good framework for 
uh, building anything. So um, I think one thing that I'm interested in is when we say we want to do something ethically, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to reinvent the, the wheel around ethics. It makes a lot of sense to draw from models that already work. And one of the things that becomes extremely clear in working the uh, sweat lodge or basically any, any item we came up with, we talked about a Hawaiian net, the process of doing that and what what kind of ethics that leads to if you were to able to, um, if you were going to build a piece of technology based on that framework, it would seem to come back again and again was this requirement of reciprocity, which seems to me to be the thing that you learn when you really deal with the, um, with ethics and ontologies and epistemologies coming out of the land. The, one of the common denominators is reciprocity. So in building the sweat lodge, you can see that there's so much reciprocity necessary to build one in a good way. Um, and so taking that and saying, oh, I want to build a sweat lodge in a good way. I know how to build a sweat lodge in a good way. How do I build a, a Lakota AI um, in a way that reflects those ethics? And similarly, we, we worked an example that didn't end up getting published um, uh, about a Hawaiian net. And what if we built a self-driving car um, based on the Hawaiian net um, framework? And again, what reciprocity, um, give, uh, you know, giving more than you take seem to be a important factor. Yeah, it's a it's a really good point. I think um, when I was when I was making that story, I was using that as a as a map. And all these old stories, I feel like there's a recurring theme of always returning back to the community time and time again. So there's that repetition going back and forth. And I think that's you know part of that is where ethics lie, right? Like you you can't you can't go far afield. Like you can't go far far afield and and speak on behalf of people that don't have the authority to do that. So you always have to come back for more uh, to, to, to return that knowledge back to the community and then also get more knowledge from the community back and forth. So that the, the back and forthness in the story and then what you're talking about in the construction of uh, the, the sweat lodges, that's some built in ethics right there. There's a limiting factor and there's an uh, there's energy giving and there's a limiting factor at the same time, you know, like it, it's, it's uh, built into the process. Yeah, one of the things that I, I thought about when I was rereading your story yesterday was about um, one thing that stands out to me in terms of other people, other parts of this AI ethics field that is exploding. Um, it seems to be that um, I really like our position paper for how generative it is and how generous it is um, and how a lot of the times we, I feel like I have to resist the urge to just critique um, and make that and say ethics is is critique, but I think in our works and, and working through frameworks and you know giving very being very generous with our um, you know with our writings was is that we are um, we're resisting the urge to critique and instead being uh, like showing that the ethics are already there. There's no reason to just live in this place where it's all um, criticism because there's so many examples of, of good ways of doing things. And I find I experience this also when we talk about critiques of capitalism and how impossible it is to, to exit capitalism, except a lot of our communities don't actually um, function with capitalism right now. They, they function on, a, um, they're outside of that system often. A lot mm -hmm. of folks don't even live in that system. Um, so I, I really love how how we're using these frameworks to generate ethics. I think there's there's also about like the the giving of the allowance of voices within the whole frame like the whole the whole uh, workshop series that we did right like we each of us has a very strong histories and very strong loud voices when when we when we need them but there was a lot of real generous time making and space making for when uh, a voice needed to be heard so no but there was no sense of there's no sense of that. Sometimes, you know, when you're out in the world, you have to fight to get your voice heard. But there was none of that sense uh, because it was done in a good way. It was done in a ceremony way. It was opened up in that territory. So we kind of all had this sense that we were, um, there was no competition to get our voices heard, right? And I think that even that basis alone, that good, uh, you know, as uh, Jason Lewis likes to say, that good mind is, is, a, is a good place to start. And the things that grow out of good minds and good hearts, they you know, inherently don't try to take more than, you know, they give, or yeah, they don't try to take more than they give and they try to do give more than they take, you know, so. Yeah, that's, 
it, that's what boggles my mind about some of the approaches to AI ethics where the thing is already built and then the, trying to reverse engineer ethics back into it when that's not that's not how it's going to be done. It, you know, there's a reason eth, uh, indigenous ethics are hy hyper local um, and have to do with relationships. Um, yeah, one, one thing I wanted to ask you, Scott, about was uh, some of the conversations that we have um, ongoing are thinking about um, anomaly, but also thinking about unknowable and unknowable things. And I and I really that really comes clear in your story uh, how much is not known in the story and how much even the main character does not know. Um, and I, I wanted to know what you know. I, I, I to me the acceptance of the unknowable as important, as more important mm. than the knowable um, is a very important part of ethics. And it's like almost the an an antithetical to enlightenment and to Western science. Mm. Um, I, uh, I was recently, uh, there's, a, there's a podcast, Lex Fridman, and he did this rec recently, or not recently, I think it's, I don't know, I forget the podcast number, but he interviewed this uh, physicist, mathematician, Jim Gates, and he says these beautiful things, and you should like. Uh, you, I'd highly recommend you listening to it because he's a he's a serious physicist, mathematician, but his his he talks about uh, he talks the the role about dreaming in his own practice. He talks about and he talks and he's a, he talks about supersymmetry or uh, uh, string theory, and he says the most beautiful thing in, in in physics, and I might be misquoting him here, but uh, is that the reason why humans exist, why planets exist, why existence exists is because of the imperfections in that symmetry, you know, and that really struck me hard. It was like this is this is exactly what that is, eh? Like we, like the anomalous stuff that, that we we talk about all the time is that those are the asymmetries that actually allow humans to uh, to be human, right? That's what makes us. And so I think um, when we approach ethics in that way, that in the acceptance of uh, course corrections and uh, coming to coming to these pro this process in a very humble way, that we know that we don't know what the next seven generations are going to have for us. So I think it's a very important thing to, to be comfortable with uncertainty, right? Like be okay. That's the nature of the world. You know, we don't, we can't be so certain. We can't be so um, um, absolute about these things, especially with our relationship with new technologies like AI. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's that I was thinking about um, how the mystery of the device, in, like even like the using the word device in your story um, to try to imply that a technology can be there um, like it's a future it's a futuristic story even though it feels like an ancient story mm -hmm. um, just by using that word device a handful of times um, and it reminds me that one of the the key things in unknowability is, that I think about is uh, how I've been thinking about talking to people about empathy a bunch this week, and I'm not big, I'm not really into empathy that much. Um, <laughs> but as a, as a technique, okay, of ethics, okay. as a technique of ethics, I'm not into empathy uh, because um, you know what happens if you can't see yourself in some another object? Like what happens if you don't? If the object does not reveal its interiority, or it's mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't have any human qualities, because if AI is accessible to um, human ethics because of this personification, anthropomorphization that's been slathered upon it. But to me, uh, what's very important to me about Lakota ideas of interiority is that even so things can have interiority whether or not I notice them or not. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not up to me, it's up to the great mystery. So um, will I extend my respect to things that don't that don't give to me because not everything is for me. Um, yeah, I would think about that in terms of your device. And it's like the device is, you know, doesn't ever be, it's not revealed in any way. The medicine isn't revealed. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was recently read a paper or a, a, an article on um, <clears throat> sort of like, I don't know what your feelings are about that, but that they've decided that it's a good thing to sort of build in built-in error choosing, right? Like, so people, you can like, you can have the AI that can totally demolish any chess player in the world now, but they realize that the actual, to actually make it, you know, 
general intelligence, you know, the bigger overarching intelligence that you need to built in a learning process. And the learning process is in the is in the making mistakes, you know. So I think what do you think about building in error, learning from errors, kind of that sort of anomalous? Yeah, I mean it's clear humans learn from error, but you know, the the question it's so interesting um, dealing with uh, trying to move between like trying to understand Lakota philosophy, which is already you know super difficult, and then trying to understand um, uh, the approaches to this whole world of human computer interaction. When the main problem to me is the def is it's called artificial intelligence, which is mm -hmm. the is two of the you know most inaccurate things to me because nothing is artificial, um, because everything comes from the earth, no matter what we do, and thinking of it as separated from nature is, is extremely dangerous, why we are in the predicaments that we are in. And then intelligence, which is, you know, to some, to lots of different communities, intelligence is not, is not the, the number one thing. And it's not what necessarily makes us beings, gives us our our existence. That's, it's low on, it's, it's like the, it's, to me, it's like, the, the mystery of existence that gives us existence. Uh, it's so weird to, to prioritize intelligence. And it's, it's a little strange too that, you know, humans are like, uh, they think they have a grasp. We, we think we, we tend to think that we have a grasp on our own sense of intelligence when like, you know, they, they call it the hard problem of consciousness for a reason because science doesn't want to talk about it because it's too impossible to really know. There's, there are people starting to beginning to think about those things, but this is one of the things that I think like the, the conundrum of artificial intelligence can help sort of illustrate is that we don't know what we don't know, right? These the big, the great unknowns. And I think having that humility that, oh, we don't even have a real good, we don't have a really great uh, understanding of our own sense of intelligences and our own relationships with the world um, before we can start labeling and naming things oh that's artificial intelligence you know but so i like that sort of idea yeah i mean the, another thing about that is labeling and hierarchies and as soon as you put intelligence on this platform which it has been uh it, it's very clear who's defining that intelligence and that's why it's very important for in for you know what we're advocating for in the ai protocols paper is this a hype, hyper local centers of knowledge and having people getting the tools to work with their own definitions of intelligence and their own their own priorities um, uh, in building um, any tool, technology, computer, software, all of it, um, because it's you know as indigenous people we know better than most uh, what it's like to be labeled as unintelligent um, and say that our songs and our philosophy is is not in, not intelligence. It's not intellectual work. It's our art isn't. Um, we don't do science, all of that stuff. It's so easily delineated. Why would we want to make tools that uphold this false sense of superiority? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's good points, good points. Um, yeah, I, we were trying to cut ourselves right off at 3.30, so, so we- <laughs> so I, know, we should, I, hope, I, hope, I hope people have questions. Um, uh, we can keep, I have other points to talk about too. I think, well, just the last point of the community is that I think the Scott model of thinking about things is that it decenters. like what the problem now is that, you know, AI uh, is, is being centralized in, in the individual or the corporation, you know, versus uh, a Scott model that keeps it within the community and keeps it a community member and not uh, a tool for, you know, growing your bank account and of a corporation, you know, so. Yeah, um, were there, I wanted to know um, if there are other mo like frameworks that you think that technologies and tools can be built off of? Because um, we, look, we looked at the net, we worked at, we looked at the sweat lodge, the octopus bag. Uh, well, you know, like I was thinking that, I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking and working my 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 artwork really really incorporates and considers the nature of language in Nishnabemwin and sort of the gluten of nature of how the how the how the language is built. It's made out of sounds, morphemes, uh, phonemes, and then words, songs, stories. 
and these are like all world building processes and you know and uh within those processes there's huge um ethics built into the language because the language i know there's a saying like the language hunts on all land and i didn't really understand it till recently in terms of the direct the truly direct relationship us as sound making creatures have with making language and then making stories and making songs and how those stories and songs carry through to the to the future generations and i think that i think considering language especially when we're talking about ai and coding language and sort of uh, all these different um ways of speaking is a very important thing to consider and how we talk and how we label things and how we can talk as indigenous people and use our own language to sort of uh, mold that relationship and foster that relationship yeah it's a good point a hyper locality of language too yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you do you do you find yourself wanting to use? Yeah, I haven't. Uh, so my my struggle is that I don't know how because it's such a such a hyper like you said hyper local. Uh, right now it's a hyper local talent thing. That if you don't know how to, uh, I'm not sure even what they're using to program in for AI. But if you don't know how to program, you're kind of out in the cold, right? There's no. Uh, Not true. I keep trying to teach you this. <laughs> oh, no, no, GPT-3, right. GPT-3. GPT right. Yeah, G yeah. I'm, I'm using GPT-2, and hopefully soon we can get into GPT-3. Um, I've been, I mean, we're big, I'm a big fan of uh, Rebecca Fiebring's Weckinator to do machine learning, um, which you could totally be good at that, too. Um, yeah, they're the tools, but those are, that's not, obviously not like general intelligence, it's not AI. These are machine learning tools. Um, mm -hmm. Some of which are highly trained, and the larger the data set, the kind of more flabbergastingly realistic. Um, but also, you know, there's the style gan stuff. And um, Has, so yeah. is, there, is there any uh, ongoing issues with GPT in terms of the ethics of the coding and how they have programmed? Yeah, I, I'm not. A, I don't even. I couldn't even begin. It's. I. <laughs> I won't try to. I'll probably say all the wrong news right. news blurbs. I know, <laughs> but. I mean, even using it, it becomes clear that it's trained on a vast amount of the internet in English uh, to right. the combination of which uh, we know is a dangerous combination. So I like one time, I mean, you can get weird experiments. Like I've done experiments um, where I try to teach spits out like kind of like racist mimic mimicry oh of the God. song. It's, so it's my fault. I mean, I said it's something I can't understand, but super interesting um, to try to goad it into. Um, there was, there was a uh, like a personal chatbot thing that I, I I was looking for it. I forgot about it because it was so terrible. But it was like it was a chatbot for, for like so you could like train it and it would talk back to you and ask you questions. And then there was a certain category of questions where it gave you a warning. Is like uh, check X check you know check chat box. Just be prepared. It might. It, openly asked, said that it might come back really inappropriate and racist wow. ask these questions right like and they still really in trials. <laughs> i forget what it was but it was like meant to be like a, a personal companion you know one of those like apps you could be like and you talk into it and the more you talk into it the more it asks you questions but then there's ones there was like just be prepared this is this is a, a beta version and it could be wow. setting so anyways very interesting. Uh, James, did you have any? I think you had a couple of questions. 